everybody. Uh, this is our first day here on Revolution 2.0. Last year was definitely a blast having every teacher uh, with us and all these experts with us just sharing so much of their passion of what they love to do, uh, their experience. And just it's very enriching to have you all here because we can all learn from each other. And even though this time of pandemic is being crazy, I think it's amazing that we can just have people from Egypt, people from Peru, from the States, from anywhere in the world together in one conference. So we have to look at the positive. And here I introduce you to Diego Palacios. He's going to tell us a little bit about his experience, who he is and what he's going to be sharing with us. Diego, the microphone is all yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Dee. I'm thrilled. I'm excited to be here with everybody today. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm a returning presenter. I was here last year uh, with a presentation as well. And it's been exciting from the very first moment, I think, that uh, the idea of having this community of educators from all around the world come together and all of us share and learn from one another has been great. I'm extremely happy. I'm excited to share about today's topic with, with everyone and also learn from you as well, since uh, as a community of educators, we can always learn from one another. So uh, again, to quickly introduce myself, my name is Diego Palacios. I'm um, an English teacher and English teacher trainer from the Instituto de Formación Docente Paraguayo Americano in Asuncion, Paraguay. I've been teaching since 2012. Great. So without being said, we can get started with today's topic, right? So as you mentioned, a little bit of a flipping sound. Yes. Please, I need you to keep your microphones muted uh, because if not, it loops the sound really crazy. So just keep your microphones muted until we let you know. Remember, this session is being recorded as well. So we want to be able to hear everything Diego has to share with us. Thank you very much. Awesome. And as Diego was mentioning, uh, we are going to be taking questions from the chat box and we'll also be interacting a little bit throughout the presentation uh, through the chat box. So I will uh, let you know when there are, you know, opportunities for commenting, for giving us your opinion. And also, if you have questions along the way, you can put them there and we'll address them more specifically towards the end of the session with a Q&A uh, question and answer uh, section. Okay, so let's get right into it. Let me start sharing my screen and we'll take it from there. So I see we also have more people joining us and that's great. All right. So Officially welcome, Revolution 2.0 Beyond the Screen. Uh, my presentation is called Implementing Student-Centered Teaching Strategies in a Virtual Environment. So this is going to focus, this presentation is going to focus on how to uh, take the student-centered approach and how to apply it with you know, practical tips, practical activities in our online classes. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. In terms of the goals or objectives that we have for this session, uh, number one, we are going to identify student-centered teaching strategies that can be used in a virtual environment. Then we are going to explore examples of student-centered activities, so practical activities that we can try out in our classes right away. And then we're going to discuss ways to adapt these activities to the context of our own classes. So we always want to do that sort of mental exercise. Okay, if I had to apply this with, uh, you know, within the context of my own class, what changes would I make? What modifications would I make to fit the needs uh, of my particular group? So we're going to be doing some thinking around that as well. Now. Since the student center approach is very broad, we are going to focus specifically on four aspects or four strategies that are going to be addressed in this session. So first, we are going to start off by identifying students' needs and goals. And we're gonna discuss, okay, how do we do that? And how do we do that specifically in a virtual environment? Then we're going to talk about how to address students' preferences. Okay, then we're going to talk about building a sense of community among learners. This is something we want uh, among the learners. We want that sense of community among them. And we also 
are going to address how to personalize our lessons. So this is kind of the cornerstone of today's presentation, and we're going to be diving right into each of these points. So now let's get started. But just before we go into the first strategy, I want to know if people recognize this character. Or you may know this character from TV. And if you do, you can put that in the in the chat box and I'll be reading what you have to say. So Lily is saying yes. And <laughs> Patrick, Patrick Start. Yeah, absolutely. I think we got some uh, SpongeBob SquarePants fans around here, right? So I think a lot of people know Patrick and love Patrick. So his pretty cool <laughs> in Spanish says Rocio. Yeah. So Patrick is pretty awesome. It's pretty famous, right? So I want to know on a scale of Patrick, how are you feeling today? So take a look at all the Patrick's on the screen from one to nine and tell us just the number as Muhammad is, is doing. So he's saying number eight. <laughs> okay. So we're going into the week in Muhammad. So I'm sure that will get better. We have four, nine, eight, five, three-ish, four, five, three, two. So we got a lot of uh, Patrick's and a lot of different emotions and feelings. So let's say two, there you go. So that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear a lot of people are, are feeling happy. And if you're like feel, feeling tired because it's been a long week, you know, uh, things are gonna start to, to, to pick up and I'm sure everything's gonna go uh, it's going to get much better. And now first day of the conference, you know, by Sunday, everyone's going to be thrilled and super happy with a lot of ideas to, to apply in their own, uh, classes. So awesome. Thank you for interacting with me and, you know, for letting me know, you know, Patrick. <laughs> All right. So let's do a quick poll in the chat. So I have, um, a question for everybody. I'll give you the, uh, the possible options as well. So if you're a teacher, um, or teacher trainer, which age groups do you teach? And I'll give you the options in a moment. And if you're a student teacher, which age groups would you like to teach? And we have three options here. You can tell us A for children, B for teenagers, and C for adults, okay? So we have people saying A, B, C, C, B. All right, that's quite a, a combination. So this is great because here we know that we have a community of educators that work with different age groups that work in different contexts. And I, and I see the, the comments coming in. This is great. So it's really good to have that diversity in terms of the um, age groups that people are teaching in this particular session. That is awesome. All right. So since we're talking about a student a center teaching or learner center teaching just to kind of put some context we're not going to be talking a lot about the theory but actually the application but just to kind of get this out of the way and we're all on the same page i want to share this quote um, from richards and farrell which says that in the first section learner center teaching means teaching that reflects learners individual differences in cognitive styles motivations needs and interests then we continue with the second part. Developing a learner center focus to your teaching involves drawing on students' life experiences, creating opportunities for students to interact and cooperate, and to develop a sense of shared interests and concerns, okay? And I wanna point out some key elements here that are gonna be very important for today's session. We have, first of all, individual differences, okay? So we wanna cater to uh, our group of students, acknowledging that all our students uh, are different. They have different motivations, needs, interests, interests, likes, dislikes. So that's very important in the student center approach. Uh, it's about acknowledging life experiences. Everyone has a different experience. Everyone learns differently as well. So acknowledging that is also key. And the piece on interaction and cooperation. Okay, so I would say these three elements we must take into consideration when uh, trying to implement student center approach in an, in an online class and in a face-to-face -face class as well, absolutely. So let's talk about the first strategy, the first out of four. We said 
first, we need to identify our students' needs and goals. Okay, this includes you know what motivates them, what do they struggle with, what drives them, what um, you know pushes them forward, and how can we use that as a way to create more student engagement, or learner engagement in our classes. So, how do we do this? There are quite a few ways. So let's talk about the first practical activity to identify students' needs and goals. And this activity is called question revealed and is great, for example, for a warm-up activity. This is what it looks like. And I'll be showing you this more in detail in a moment, but you have basically a grid. Okay, this is from a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So this is a grid with written numbers um, on the grid, right? So what students have to do is they have to select a number from the grid and the teacher has to reveal the hidden question or the prompt behind the number, okay? And then here it's, I believe, very small, but um, I'll make the, the picture bigger in a moment. And it says a number four, what motivates you to learn English? Okay, so that's one example of a prompt or question for, for a warm-up activity. And once we reveal the number, what happens is a brief conversation takes place based on the question or prompt. So in this case, we have what motivates you to learn English? And that's a starting point. That's a talking point to get students to, uh, you know, give information that is going to be valuable for us teachers to understand where they're at. Okay. Then, uh, as I was saying, we, we can use these questions to know more about students' needs, their goals, their interests what they're into. This is going to help us assess, get that sort of first-hand assessment of what they like, what they don't like, what they need. And later on, don't worry so much about where you're going to find this because I'll give you uh, a slide with um, uh, the resources where you can get uh, all of these activities. And this is available on a website that's called Technologic WordPress. It's a whole bunch of uh, resources there. And the cool thing is that the questions can be customized. And I think that as teachers, we love that. We love customizable resources because, again, we understand that every context is different and every group of students is also different. So you can customize the questions, the prompts, uh, depending also on the age group, on the language level of our students, and the aspects that you wish to learn more about. So this is what it would look like, again, uh, as a PowerPoint um, slide, the grid, where students would select, for example, uh, we're going to go in order here just for you to see what kind of questions you could include in an activity such as this one. So if students were to choose number one, they would have, what's the hardest thing about English? You can get the ball roll in here. Students might say, it's remembering the tenses or maybe vocabulary maybe pronunciation, and this is going to give you an idea of the things that maybe they struggle with, uh, with the language. Also, you know, you can throw in uh, a couple of things related to more of their likes, such as uh, what's your favorite TV show? And this can later on uh, help you to, you know, include things related to what they like. And this is obviously going to create more engagement. This is something they're going to be interested in learning more about, okay? Uh, just continuing with uh, a few sample uh, prompts or questions. Uh, who's your favorite singer? Uh, what motivates you to learn English? What's your favorite animal? Okay, and again, think about the different age groups that these questions would work well with, right? Who's your favorite actress? What's your favorite app? Because again, since we're talking about a virtual environment, we also want to acknowledge the fact that students uh, use technology a lot. Right, so maybe there's some information there that you can gather. You know, do they use social media? Do they use uh, this particular type of app? So you can make some connection to what they're into. Right, what's your favorite color? Favorite actor? What's your job or occupation? If, for example, you you teach adults, uh, what do you remember from your previous course? Who's your favorite YouTuber? What's your favorite band? What's your favorite book? What's your favorite word in English? And this is always a, a funny one because you know people will start thinking uh, like very hard about which word they actually really like in the language. What's your favorite movie, food, sport? When's your birthday? 
and what's your favorite day of the week. So again, this is customizable. And also think about this uh, in, the, in the chat and tell us, what other questions do you think you could include on this grid? If you were to use this grid with your students, what could you add there that you think, okay, this is important information that I wanna know about my students and that's gonna help me uh, plan my future lessons. Because remember, all this information we gather is going to help us uh, inform our lesson planning process, okay? So think about what other questions you could, or prompts you could put here on the screen and let us know in the, in the chat, okay? Now, moving on to the next activity, let's talk about a KWL chart, right? And for this, you can also let us know, what do you think KWL stands for? This is a very helpful tool. Remember, we're still talking about identifying needs and goals. So maybe you've used a KWL chart. You can put in the, uh, in, in the chat, what do you think this stands for? No, well, no, learn. Okay, people are commenting, that's great. Uh, and Macarena is also saying a warm up activity and also including the content they saw in the week. That is great. It's a great way to apply this. And yeah, people are absolutely right about the KWL chart. So this is a graphic organizer. I'm gonna show this to you in just a moment. It's to collect data on what students know, what they wanna know or learn and what they learned. Okay, so that's why it's called KWL, know, wanna know or learn and learned. And it helps us focus on a topic in particular, right? So the cool thing is you can do this at the start and end of a unit, of a lesson or a semester. So it's pretty flexible in terms of when you can apply uh, this or you can do this particular activity. This is going to provide you with data that can inform lesson planning. Again, remember we're identifying what students need and what their goals are. And this is gonna help us shape our lessons. You can use Jamboard or Padlet for this uh, particular activity. And I wanna go ahead and just switch screens for a moment and I'm going to go to Jamboard. So maybe people have heard about uh, Jamboard, it's a pretty cool uh, tool by Google, All right? And here we go. Okay, so, well, Diego is switching, well, Diego is switching screens. Remember, sorry, you have the questions and answer tab on the right. You have chat, polls, people, and questions and answers. So just tap on there. If you have a question, just start writing them over there so we can review them towards the end of the presentation. Diego, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. So yeah, remember to put your uh, questions over there, okay? So we'll be addressing them towards the end of this session. So yes, we are talking about a KWL chart, which is this one over here. And yes, this is called Jamboard, okay? Up here it says jamboard.google.com. Uh, so, and it's pretty easy to use, okay? This is from uh, a few weeks ago. So we did this at the start of the semester uh, with my student teachers. And again, for, for an adults group and it was pretty cool to see what they came up with. The sort of the core topic or the main topic they wanted them to think about was teaching. So my title is let's talk about teaching, right? And I divided this uh, Jamboard into three different columns, okay? The K column is for what I know about teaching from previous semesters in my own experience. So I wanna know, or I want to know what they knew about teaching, right? also what they want to learn about teaching this semester. And then we left the third column uh, open because we are going to continue and we're gonna uh, fill up the third column at the end of the semester because here we have what I learned about teaching this semester, okay? And just to show you some of the answers that they came up with, which were pretty cool, uh, they said, for example, it is really important to plan your classes and follow the steps of the, we use the presentation practice production uh, method, right? Then 
Um, never go unprepared from students, right? So this is pretty cool. They, they pick this up either you know, along the way in our classes or through their own experience. Um, let's see, we have uh, quite a few more here, okay? Uh, yeah, it's important to know how to correct mistakes, okay, so error correction that they picked up along the way as well. Uh, be responsible and always uh, prepare plan B, okay? So this is what uh, my students said about teaching and what they knew, right, and they know. Now, what they wanted to learn, and this is, um, this is key, because I, I take this information and I include this into our curriculum, okay, into the, the syllabus for, for this semester. And uh, the students said, for, for example, uh, what to do when we have questions without answers. So basically, if there's something that uh, we don't have the answer to, okay? Uh, how to improve our lesson planning. Um, let's see, ways to introduce a new topic, conflict management techniques, and so on. So there were um, quite a few really interesting things that students uh, put here. And how does this work? Basically, uh, I, as a teacher, create this uh, file on Jamboard, jamboard.google.com. And the way that we worked on this particular board was I had them use this sticky note here, okay? And they would be able to write their thoughts here. Okay, I'm just gonna put hello. I'm gonna put save, and that generates uh, a new sticky note. So I can drag this around. I can put it in the first, second, or third category. I can make it you know, kind of like spin. I can also make it smaller and bigger to, to make it fit in the columns. And it's a pretty cool thing to consider when you are doing kind of a needs analysis or to see where everyone's at. Uh, there you go. And you also thank you so much for sharing the, uh, the website there, the link. All right, so let me stop sharing my Jamboard and I will go back to where we were just a few moments ago. All right, so that was Jamboard. And now let's talk a little bit about student motivation. Because again, as we're identifying their needs, their goals, we need to know what motivates our students and to use this to our advantage and which is ultimately going to be to their advantage as well, All right? So one very quick way to also collect information on what you know, students find motivating is to come up with a survey such as this one, a very uh, simple survey where students have to read through a list of items, right, and mark one, two, three for whether that item in particular demotivates them, they feel neutral about it, or it motivates them to work hard. To give you an example, um, and again, this is completely customizable, being interested in the topic of the lesson. So it's here the first item. And students would have to mark if that demotivates them, they're neutral about it, or that actually motivates them, which you know, I would say 99% of the time, you know, when the, the topic is interesting, this is gonna be motivating uh, to students, okay? Uh, maybe receiving praise, feeling happy, seeing other people doing better than me, working in groups, working in pairs, uh, finding the work easy, having clear goals for the lesson, having clear rules about how we work together in class, sitting still for a long time, being in a bad mood, and feeling that I have some choice in what I do. So again, these are this is just a collection of items that you can choose to include, adapt um, when you're working on developing your survey, right? And again, it's gonna help you get this information on what students find motivating. Uh, a good way to do this is to use it at the start of a new term or a, or a new semester or a new school year, okay? So you can have that information ready. You can modify the items to fit students' uh, language level, you know, their, their age group as well. If you're working with younger uh, students, you may wish to, um, you know, modify the, the, the language to make it easier to understand for them. And I find that using Google Forms can be a good way to prepare and administer this survey, okay? So there you go, student motivation survey. And I did this with um, a few groups and the results were really 
uh, insightful. So just to show you, this is a part of the data that I gathered from uh, one of the groups, which was a small group of about uh, eight students. Uh, I found out that uh, most of the people, most of the students in that particular group found having clear rules about how we work together in class to be very important, okay? Then I also found that having clear goals for the lesson was something that motivated most of them. And also that feeling they had some choice in what they did, you know, as part of the course that was also motivating to them. So taking these results as a kind of action plan, what I did is I tried to address these results by you know, putting in place some strategies. As it says here, having clear class rules is addressed through the use of a class netiquette. And uh, in case this is a new term, netiquette means etiquette for the internet. Okay, so uh, the, kind of the, the list of rules or expectations and behaviors that we want our students to have during our online classes. And I'll show you an example of class netiquette in just a moment. Also, having clear goals is addressed by reinforcing the goals of the lesson at the start and at an end of each class. Uh, it's important, both face-to-face you know, -face classes, but uh, particularly online classes, that we let students know this is what we want to achieve. Okay, These are the goals for our lesson, and to review them at the start and at the end of the lesson. I'll also show you what that could look like. Feeling that I have some choice in what I do, and I think this is the one that has had the biggest impact um, on my classes. So this is addressed through the way in which students submit assignments. So allowing that little bit of leeway, that liberty for students to um, you know, submit assignments and show what they have learned in a way that they feel most comfortable with or in a way that they can be creative. Having that little bit of liberty, I have found that it works very, very well. And I'll give you some ideas on, on how to do that as well. <clears throat> We were talking about class netiquette and lesson goals. And this is what I use for all of my classes. Okay, I'll choose, uh, sorry, I'll adapt, I'll edit the class netiquette depending on the, the age group and the, you know, the type of uh, group that I have of that particular day. But having these rules or just, uh, you know, bullet points in place really helps structure everything. Um, especially when it comes to respectful interaction between students. Uh, for example, remember that our class starts at 9 a.m., meaning that students need to be punctual. We are going to start the classes uh, on time. Uh, use your name and last name to enter the class. Students also know they need to come in, use their, their, their name for identification purposes and then obviously for security purposes as well. Um, it's always good to remind students to have the materials that they're going to need to choose a, a place, a quiet place where they can concentrate, uh, to keep their cameras open if this is possible for them, and to interact with one another respectfully, using the microphone, the reactions, and the chat. And it seems like this is a small detail, but the class netiquette really has a big impact on the way that um, you know classes progress, right? This gives students a structure, it gives them a sense of familiarity, they know what we teachers are expecting from them. So if, if you haven't tried this out, go ahead and see if there are um, any changes, okay? But it works, it tends to work very well for structuring um, your, your classes and what you want students to do. Uh, we were talking about the importance of setting lesson goals and to make them visible, right? So this is kind of a sample slide that I, I would use in a class where we're talking about extreme sports something as simple as this. In this lesson, you will be able to, and very straightforward, name extreme sports, describe your favorite extreme sport, and create a new extreme sport. And we're, again, we're talking about very uh, tangible, concrete, measurable, observable outcomes that we want our students to, to achieve, okay? And going over this at the start and at the end of the class helps them understand that there is a purpose for the things we're doing in the class. There is a north that we are sort of following we're, we're headed towards and you know making it visible because again since we're working online uh, in, in a lot of our classes uh, we need to provide that extra structure to everything we do 
And just putting this slide and going over them, making sure students understand what we're going to be doing that day is a great way to provide that sense of direction, of structure. Now, we move from identifying students' needs and goals to addressing students' preferences. And again, this is a broad topic, but we're going to be focusing on two particular um, sort of subtopics uh, of students' preferences. The first one is preferences for particular kinds of classroom activities. And we see that for online learning, we have various ways of uh, promoting interaction, okay? This is something really cool about technology that we can rely on a lot of different ways uh, for students to, to interact with us, to tell us how they feel, to give us their opinion. And this goes way beyond opening their microphone and, and, and writing in the chat, okay? They can use reactions, they can use uh, body language. So there's a lot of cool ways to see what students feel most comfortable with in classroom activities. Now, <clears throat> we have primarily three ways of approaching these classroom activities. We can start off with whole class activities. So like we're doing here, we have everybody in the same virtual room and we're all together, okay? This is sort of the, the main discussion that is taking place. Then we have to consider the impact or possible impact of pair activities. For this, you would have to, um, send students, for example, to breakout rooms, to smaller virtual uh, rooms where they can discuss in pairs. And we can also consider the impact of group activities, okay? So uh, having these three, which are, all of them are really great, uh, which ones do you personally find that you, that you use the most? Okay, so all of them are great and we use them all the time. Is there one that you maybe uh, favor more than the others because you feel that your students uh, feel most comfortable with? If so, uh, you can let us know in the chat box, okay? Pear says Angelito. Thank you for letting us know. There you go. Leonard says group activities, pair work, breakout rooms. Thank you, Maria Francisca. Mohammed says group activities. Monica says group as well. So this is great. We see that each of these modes of working, right, have their, their advantages and they tackle something different, okay? So we may start off with whole class activities where we want everybody to get the information uh, that they're gonna need in order to work. But then, you know, we may decide to have them work in pairs to start exchanging some ideas. And if we want them to go into full uh, cooperation mode where everyone has to, for example, do a certain role, then, you know, group activities are great. I see the more answers are coming in and thank you for sharing uh, in the chat. An important thing to take into consideration here is that it's good to determine which type of interaction will benefit students the most, okay? So if we're talking about developing teamwork skills, then we would obviously lean more towards group activities, okay? But you can also leave that room to see, okay, which uh, type of interaction do my students in this particular group feel most comfortable with, okay? And kind of use that to your advantage and maybe capitalize and emphasize that type of, uh, those types of activities, because that's where you're gonna get uh, sort of, the, the most advantages from, okay? And again, it's good to switch around uh, between these types of interactions, but then again, capitalize on the one that you find uh, works best for that particular group, okay? Uh, class temperature check using Google Forms before and after. That is great, Chris. Thank you so much for, for sharing that in the chat. And there are some group-based options that are very uh, worth considering. Okay, and this is, these are kind of um, a set of activities that tend to work very well in online classes. They transfer very well over to online classes and they promote uh, group uh, cooperation. They promote this interaction. Uh, we have from the, the most simple, which is oral presentations, right? and we'll go over this in a moment. We have role play, interviews, and debates. So these are just some of the 
many activities that actually tend to work very well. Obviously, there, there is some work that needs to be done to prepare students for each of these activities, but they tend to uh, work very well in an online environment. And if you haven't tried them out, uh, I suggest you, you, you give it a try and see how your students feel about that, okay? So you can turn uh, an oral presentation, meaning that you know, students do a discussion in, in breakout rooms. Maybe next time you can try and do a role play activity to see how they feel about it. And you will see that some groups maybe prefer the oral presentation format while others feel a lot more comfortable kind of embodying uh, a different role, right? Same happens for interviews. You can have them interview one another in a group and you can have them do a, a debate. As long as you know this has been sort of pre-taught, they know how a debate works, that it's about uh, respecting everybody else's opinions. So there is some work to be done uh, with each of these uh, formats. And I think that the advantage here in considering these uh, uh, different options is when you can give students the opportunity to each group to choose how they're going to present their work. And this goes back to what we were saying, that little bit of freedom that they have, you know, option A, B or C, that really goes a long way, okay? Some groups will feel great doing an oral presentation. Others will feel great doing role play, maybe interviews or debates. It's a matter of seeing, you know, uh, what works best for that particular group of students and using your experience to inform your lesson planning. If you see that something is working really well, you know that for that group, you can take advantage of that way of working and continue to use it in the future. Now, the second type of preferences. So first we talked about preferences for uh, particular kinds of classroom activities, you know, the type of interaction that they prefer. Now, preferences for submitting assignments. And this is what I mentioned before as having probably the, the biggest impact on, on, on my particular classes, okay? And I think that this would probably apply to a lot of everyone else's classes as well because the underlying concept behind this. So we have assignments that we know this is a must for, for every course. We want students to use the, the time outside of uh, class to, to think about the topics that, that we address during class, right, to, to do a follow-up activity, to do maybe do some research. Now, <clears throat> when we think about assignments, we can consider sometimes, or a lot of times, moving away from the traditional, you know, submitting um, a written report, okay? And we can consider what other options do we have that technology can offer us and that could be accessible to students and that could, you know, make the assignment a lot more uh, engaging and entertaining even uh, depending on our, what our students like. So I'm gonna be showing you some of these options. Uh, the first one you were looking at is a mind map. Then we have this very cool website which is called Vakaroo. Okay, maybe some of you have heard about it. Uh, maybe it's new for, for others as well. And we have this cool thing which is uh, an infographic, kind of like a brochure, uh, a flyer. It's, it's pretty cool, okay? And these are all customizable and they can be used for obviously academic purposes. And let's get into how they can be used. Um, so we start off with what I think is the uh, sort of the most straightforward approach, which is to have students submit um, a written assignment, okay? So maybe they'll write a sentence, a paragraph, uh, an essay about a particular topic, okay? So we go from there, that's the sort of a more straightforward one, which is obviously very possible in when we're using platforms, we're using you know, learning management systems and so on. But we can also take into consideration uh, the possibility of mind maps, okay? So mind maps are uh, pretty cool in terms of, you know, the way that they allow students to do brainstorming, okay? So if you see the first example in the upper left corner, that's a very, very simple mind map that you can find a, a here where it says mindmap with a U, dot com. And this one is about extreme sports. And if we want, for example, students to um, uh, tell us, you know, what their favorite extreme sports are that they learned during class, we can have them do a mind map on it, okay? As you see here, we have in the very center, extreme sports, and this, then this 
you know, we have the different offshoots, snowboarding, base jumping, parasail, and skydiving. So it's um, a little bit of a switch from just having them write, these are my favorite sports, okay? Then another possibility is to use um, an audio recording website, which is vakaru.com. Super simple to use. And what it does is basically it records sounds, it records your voice, and it generates a link that is going to allow you to share this with your teacher, for example, okay? And it can use, be used for a whole bunch of activities. But since we're talking about assignments, if we want, for example, students to uh, practice their speaking skills, okay, we want them, instead of writing uh, a report, we want them to tell us, you know, what were the highlights of this unit? Um, what did you like most about this unit? Instead of writing, they can actually go ahead and in a very simple manner, record their voices and say, what I liked most about this unit was this and so and so, right? So we're gonna be looking at that in just a moment, but keep that in mind. Vakaru is a great way to record um, uh, your voice and to share it with a link. Also, we have infographics, which uh, this takes a little bit of pre-teaching and you know, our students, a lot of times are very good with technology. And since we're talking about giving them the choice, right? They, they, they're not forced to always do infographics or always do you know, audio recordings, but we're giving them the options to. And you will see that as someone who feels comfortable with technology is feeling creative, they're gonna go ahead and try this out. Avisme.co, as it says there. That's a great way to create infographics. And this is a sample infographic that I created, the one that, I, that you see uh, at the center of the screen that says, best language learning tips. So imagine you have an assignment where you want students to give you their best language learning tips. And they could decide, okay, do I wanna write a paragraph about this? Completely possible, it's great. Or do I want to write a mind map? Do I wanna create a mind map with my best language learning tips? Do I want to record my voice you know, for a minute or two, explaining the best way to learn languages? Or do I wanna be like super creative? You know, I like challenges. I wanna go and create an infographic, which is possible by using a template. So the one you see on the screen was a template that I edited, that I modified. I changed the, you know, the text and I changed the pictures as well. And as an example, for number one, I, I put, Set up a schedule, decide what time works best for you. Remember, you'll need to stick to that schedule and be consistent, okay? So again, it's a, it's a way of allowing students to see the, the variety of options they can choose from. And the end result is we get to see what students learned about the topic, okay? Maybe at the end of a unit, at the end of a, you know, a school year. So having that option to choose really goes a long way. So go ahead and, and try them out. Uh, also, at the end of today's session, um, if we have time, I'm going to go ahead and, and show you um, specifically how to move things around with uh, these tools. But uh, for the time being, uh, you, know, you can take notes and go try them out uh, uh, for your upcoming classes, OK? Uh, one more way of submitting assignments. And obviously, this works best with uh, perhaps uh, young adults or adults, which is uh, YouTube, okay? There's an option on YouTube to upload a hidden video, okay? Meaning that only you have access to, to the video and you can share this, for example, with your teacher, with your instructor. We, we actually tried this out with uh, groups of adults before. Works just fine. If you want students to, uh, you know, Instead of recording their voice, you want them to practice, let's say, public speaking, because your unit is about public speaking, giving a speech, okay, maybe uh, body language, uh, facial expressions. A great way of having students practice this would be to give them the option to uh, shoot a very short uh, YouTube video and share the hidden link with you, okay? So you control who has access to that video, okay? Here, I would say the main takeaway of this section is that 
leeway or that little bit of freedom that we give students and the choice that they can make in how they want to show what they have learned. And as I said, this has had a great, great impact on, on, my, on my particular classes. Uh, the next strategy, right, we're moving on uh, from addressing students' uh, preferences to building a sense of community among learners. This is super important. As teachers, we obviously want to create and promote, foster uh, an environment where everybody feels good, okay? It feels, be, it feels good to be in this class. Uh, I, I feel good when I share about uh, something that's important to me. I feel that, you know, what I'm saying, people are listening to it, right? So how do we build a sense of community among learners? And you may recognize this activity from the start of our presentation. So I was asking uh, people, do you know who this character is? And you know, 100% of attendees said, yes, that's Patrick Start, Star, right? So uh, these kinds of uh, activities work very well for the following reasons, okay? They can be used as a warm up uh, to find out how students are feeling that day. And this is, this is really important because we're giving students uh, a space, a moment there to say, you know, I'm feeling a little tired today um, or I'm feeling very happy today. And this kind of, again, helps to check the temperature of, of the room, so to speak, okay? Um, and, and, and it's good because it acknowledges that students are not, are not there, they're just to listen to the teacher, but you know, they come with, uh, you know, maybe a long day, a long week, and we acknowledge that. And the fact that we can add a little bit of humor, this is always great, okay? This helps students uh, feel less anxious, it lowers the effective filter. So students don't feel as anxious. They know this is a friendly environment. We're gonna be laughing, we're gonna be working, but we're gonna be having fun, right? And this can be used with characters that students like, and this is one of the things I like best, okay? You can use Patrick Star, maybe for uh, children groups, for teenagers. You can also, you know, uh, for teenagers, use maybe something related to superheroes to uh, you know, something that they're into, like if they're into uh, a TV show, okay, if you're into uh, a rock band, so you can use something related to that. And, you know, with adults, you can also use this sort of humorous type of content. But once you know what students are into, it's going to be a lot easier. And there you go. Thank you so much, D. These are memes, basically. And if you, for example, find out that your students, um, you know, love dogs, or they love cats, just by going on the internet, performing a very quick Google search, you know, um, on a scale of meme, and then you put cats, literally, on a scale of meme, cats, you're gonna find you know, a whole lot of options. And you can use this, sorry, uh, with the characters or, you know, whatever students like, and kind of switch it up uh, every, every class, every week, every once in a while because it, you know, it also lets students know that you're paying attention to what, what they like. And this is important. Students realize, okay, the teacher knows what I like, his, his or she's you know, trying to incorporate into um, the lesson what we are into. So that also creates this really cool rapport between you and your students. So go ahead and give that a try. Now, a lot of us have tried show and tell in face-to-face -face classes. It's a pretty cool activity. Remember, we're talking about creating that sense of a community. And, and ba basically what happens with show and tell is students bring to class something that is important to them, such as a photo, a trophy, or a book, and they talk about it, okay? It has to be something that's meaningful to them. And what happens is this lets everybody know what, what is valuable to others. And I'll give you just a quick example in a moment. And for example, um, a few weeks ago with one of my uh, students, I did this show and tell, virtual show and tell, and I show them, let's see if I can bring this up to the camera. And I don't know if people know what this is. Uh, take, a, take a quick look at this. And if you know what this is, uh, let us know in the, in the chat, right? So I actually brought this as a, my show and tell object, and it was pretty awesome. So I asked them, what do you think this is? And Angelita is saying, Guitar pick, and you're absolutely right. So I asked students, uh, why do you think I, you know, I brought this into the class? And you know, some of them knew that I was into music, that I played the guitar. So 
that was a good starting point. And <laughs> thanks for the prize. There you go. So it's a, it's a pretty cool way to start up. You know, as a teacher, we model the activity first. I tell them, you know, this is, and it is true. This is a pic that I carry with me everywhere I go. I should put it in my wallet. Um, I try not to lose it because it's very easy to lose guitar picks. And once you lose them, you never find them again. It's as simple as that. And you know, ne you never know when you're gonna have to play the guitar. So I wanna be ready when there's a guitar around, okay? So students took that as a model and we actually did that the class before. So they knew what to expect next class. And a lot of them, you know, brought, as, as it says here, they brought a photo of someone that, you know, means a lot to them. Uh, one of my students brought a trophy. Uh, it was from a martial arts competition. We did not know that he was into martial arts. So this is the type of thing that's really cool about show and tell. It gives you kind of a, a side that you maybe did not know about someone in your class, and that's pretty cool. So everyone started talking about, you know, the, the trophy, you know, you know, how long have you been into martial arts, and, and, so, and so on. Yes, kids love showing off their favorite toys. And, and that goes to the point of uh, the next three uh, pieces of information we have here. People love doing this, you know, uh, kids with their toys, uh, teenagers, usually they'll find something related to technology, like this or this is my smartphone. I love it, right? Or um, you know, a tablet that means a lot to me, right? So you'll have this really cool stuff. And adults, they'll also be very eager to talk about what means a lot to them. So the way that uh, we normally do it is I have students uh, do the show and tell in breakout rooms first. So they can talk to their, their peers first. It works with clothes as well. Yeah, exactly. So this is my favorite t-shirt, for example. So I'll have students go into breakout rooms first. So, you know, the anxiety is not so high. They're doing this with their peers. And then when we come back, uh, I ask our volunteers. And, you know, there's always someone's like super excited. Uh, I want to share this with the rest of the class. And that offers an opportunity to do a back and forth. Okay, so if I were talking about, again, my guitar pick, they, you know, the questions that came up, I remember specifically were like, what's your favorite song to play? How long have you been playing the guitar? So this is cool. This is real communication. You know, people are interested in finding out more about uh, what, what this person is presenting. And uh, can, this can be connected. This is the last uh, bullet point at the bottom. This can be connected to the unit you're covering in class. For example, we also did this activity uh, where we were talking about entertainment, specifically books and, and movies. And you know, ask students to bring their favorite book to class, right? Uh, I modeled the, the activity. This is uh, one of my favorite books. This is *Crime and Punishment*, uh, classic literature by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, right? So, a lot of people are interested in reading. They brought their books along. Uh, others, they were more into movies or music, so maybe they brought a poster that, that was related to that and started talking about why that meant a lot to them. And it was obviously directly related to the unit, which was entertainment. And it was something that they had a personal connection with and that fostered real communication. So always a great activity to build that sense of community. Another activity you can do is the end of the week exit tickets. And here we have this uh, little example that says, I'm happy it's guy feeling super great. Uh, I'm happy that this week I finished all my assignments on time, okay? So let's talk about exit tickets. Uh, exit tickets are specific tasks that students need to complete to exit the class. So once we finish, as we start to wrap up, we ask students, there's this one final task that you need to complete so you can leave the class successfully or exit the class successfully. And it has to be a specific task. Uh, task. Uh, this encourages reflection on students weekly achievements. Uh, it can be modified to focus on specific emotions each week, such as what are you happy about this week? What are you proud about this week? What are you excited about this week? Or you can do this, you know, every other class as well. I find that it works best at the end of the week as a way of looking back and seeing what students achieved. Okay, but again, you can modify this. And also another cool thing is it can be related to academic achievements, such as, you know, what are you uh, happy about this week? And we have the example up there that says, I'm happy that this week I've finished all my assignments. That's something that serves some praise. Okay, well done, good job. But, you know, 
a student can also tell you, uh, you know, I'm I'm very happy because I went to uh, my favorite uh, to the concert where my favorite band was playing. Okay, so just acknowledging the fact that you know, at the end of the week, let's look back what was what was good about it, and let's go into the weekend or let's head into next week with this positive mindset. And again, it's acknowledging what's important to students. So try that, the exit ticket. The ticket. And finally, this is the, the last strategy. We move on from building a sense of community to personalizing our lessons. So uh, there are a couple of ways, actually a, a lot of ways, but we're gonna focus our, on a couple of ways to personalize uh, our lessons, meaning to make lessons more personal in terms of you know, how the content is aligned, aligned to students' lives, um, interests, uh, motivations, and so on, right? Using real interviews as class material. This is a pretty cool activity that you can go ahead and, and try out. When, when I say real interviews, what I mean is not one that you found on the internet, somebody else did, but one that is produced either by you as a teacher or by students. And I'll explain a couple of ways that you can do this. Alternative number one is that students prepare questions for the teacher to interview someone. And the way that we did this um, uh, a few months ago was that since as teachers we rotate, I knew that they knew uh, a bunch of teachers already. Right? So I told them, you know what? We are going to interview so-and-so, okay? And I want you guys to help me prepare a set of questions uh, for this teacher, okay? They were, you know, they were really, really excited about it. They had a good rapport with this previous teacher, so that was really excited to do, uh, exciting to do. So they prepared the questions, and I was the one to reach out to uh, my colleague within the interview, and then I brought back the results, okay? Uh, uh, back then, what we did is we used Zoom, okay? It was a Zoom interview with this uh, colleague of mine who had been their teacher. And Another alternative, students prepare questions and they interview the person. So if you can get, you know, maybe a colleague um, to come into your class for five, 10 minutes and students having previously prepared a set of questions, they can go ahead and interview this person. That's awesome. Okay, it also works very well. So the products that result from this activity can be used as class material for future lessons. Okay, you can use, um, uh, these interviews for reading comprehension, if there's a transcript, or for listening comprehension, if it's a recording, okay? So you're including something real with, with people that they know that included questions they prepared, and they're now using that as a class material, okay? And finally, using real anecdotes as class material. Um, life accounts, so anecdotes as class material. If you can get students to share positive anecdotes, that's super important. Uh, share positive anecdotes and what they learn from those specific situations, this can become a really good uh, talking point and it can actually become um, a material for an activity that you can go ahead and do. How does that work? Uh, the products that result from this activity can be used as class material for our lessons, a guessing game, Q&A, problem solving activities. To share uh, about very briefly about how we did this is we had students, uh, so I had students send me their positive anecdotes, so nothing embarrassing, nothing that would cause anxiety. The, the positive anecdotes, I had uh, them send them to me, and I selected a few of them. I said, uh, are you okay with, with me using this for the class? You know, it was, uh, there were happy anecdotes, and uh, yeah, I, I, with their permission, I went ahead and shared. This is the so-and-so's anecdotes, well, let's see what we can do with this. So we went through the anecdote, and then we came up with some critical uh, thinking questions. Like, what would you have done if you have, had been in this person's place? And what would you have done differently? What do you think this person did great that turned out to be a great idea, okay? And this worked very well, again, because it was a positive anecdote, uh, students were okay with it, and we were able to use that for a class discussion in breakout rooms, turned out to be really, really cool, right? Just a quick summary before we uh, get to the end of our session. We have the four strategies that we looked at today. We talked about identifying students' needs and goals, first of all, right? 
Then we went to the second strategy, which was addressing students' preferences. We talked about building a sense of community among learners. And finally, we talked about personalizing our lessons and uh, using you know, real life experiences, uh, such as you know, the interview and the anecdotes as class material so that it is more meaningful to the class. Okay, and as we get ready to wrap up, our exit ticket uh, is the following. So we have two questions. You can you know, go ahead and, and answer either one of them in the chat. The first one is, which of the activities presented in this session have you tried before and what were the results? So please, uh, if you want, go ahead and share with us what the experience was. You can use the chat. And also, which of the activities, tools, or strategies presented would you like to try out in your upcoming classes? So which ones have you tried? What were the results? And which ones would you like to try out? Okay, you can leave us your comments in the chat. And these are some useful resources that I went over today. We have the PowerPoint game, which was the grid at the beginning. That's technologicwordpress.com. The mind maps is from mindmap.com with a U. Online voice recorder, we have Bakaroo. We have the infographics at visme.co. And some free photos and slides. Really cool, uh, high quality material on freepick.es and slidesgo.com. Okay, so we've made it to the end of this session. And Dee, do we have some time for some uh, final maybe questions, remarks? Yes, yes, we do. And actually, we have a question. Um, it says, what's the ideal and healthy online class duration? I don't know if you have some input on that. Right, so uh, I would say that a lot of the time, this depends more on institutional policy. So there's a lot of it, it, you know ways to, to go about it. Um, I would say that best results usually go from 45 minutes to maybe an hour or an hour and a half. That's where you know you can sort of keep students fresh, right? Uh, like entertain them, but also give them you know a lot of challenges, and they won't be tired. Um, usually, when we go over maybe an hour, an hour and a half, uh, two hours, uh, it is good to incorporate brain breaks. Okay, so brain breaks. You can uh, look this up. There's actually a lot of content on this as well. Uh, if you're going for over an hour and a half, you know, incorporate uh, brain breaks, meaning activities that help students kind of clear their mind for a little while, maybe for five minutes. You can include um, some breaks uh, in between. And so I would say between 45 and 60 minutes for like one period of time, maybe an hour and a half uh, tops. And over that, perhaps uh, include some, uh, you know, some breaks or some brain breaks. So that would be my answer to that. Thank you, thank you. And yes, and also you have to consider obviously the age of your students. So if you're working yeah. with like kindergartens, uh, what an adult can do, Absolutely. they won't be able, you will have mayhem going on there. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Anything else uh, that you maybe have been listening to and something triggered a question there? Just write it there. If you are here on stage, you can also open your mic. This is the time you can actually open your microphone if you want to ask Diego any questions. I can also see that people are commenting in the chat that they've used real interviews as class material, that it um, that it turned out pretty well. Uh, the real anecdote strategy, says Julianne as well, collaborative writing, reading, and art, show and tell. Yeah. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a lot of cool things happening in the chat box here. Handcrafts as well, nice, very nice. Very good. Okay, so they use also Google Forms for Test, okay, yes. Exactly, and they're planning to use Patrick Starr there. <laughs> that's good, that's good. And show and tell, that's really nice. All right. So Diego, I actually had a question for you. Why do you yeah. think that want to learn, and the, the part that want to learn is so important to be included? I think 
uh, many times we just go with the curricula, what we need to cover, and our mind is just so concentrated on that. Why is it important to add this part? Yeah, it's really important because, um, especially nowadays, we have students that are, you know, all the time on either social media or they're, you know, using technology. So this has become kind of like a normal thing for them. And we don't want to have that just normal attitude when they join our classes. This is actually, our classes are a space for them, you know, to be creative, to learn the language, obviously, but we want to go beyond the language. We want to, uh, we want to give them the tools so that they can reach their own goals. What does this mean? If I'm someone who, you know, is like very interested in, in art or I'm very interested in music, I'm very interested in, in reading, um, I want the student to understand that this is a place for them to grow in that sense as well. And what this does is it creates motivation in the student to want to be there, okay? They, they see the need to be there. They see the purpose of being there. And I think that would be kind of the, the, main, uh, the main answer, the purpose. Uh, we wanna make sure that students know that it's worth their time being there because they'll they'll get a takeaway that's going to help them beyond the class they're not there for a grade they're there for their goals and sometimes we actually have to help students figure out what their goals are right they have a lot of likes interests but you know if you can figure out what the goals of those students are then there's going to be a much uh, i think stronger sense of purpose for being in your class because they know they're going to have a great takeaway and that's just this is going to help them get closer to that goal they have thank you thank you diego and we have another question uh, oh, sorry i got a question yes go ahead right uh, uh since flipping the classrooms in online education has become very common and uh, very useful in creating for food classes in, in the online environment uh, one way to create a flipped lessons and flipped classrooms is to uh, input the target a student before starting class and then that student comes and teaches a teacher. Uh, does it really need to be the student who is the, the, the most adapted student in the class or it can be other students with more facilitating from the teacher? Yeah, a little bit of like an audio problem there, kind of a, an, an echo that I wasn't able to, to catch uh, the, the question. Yeah. I think okay. Mohammed, you were asking, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do, do, do you need uh, me to restate what I said? Yeah, could you? Well, I'm, I'm having issues too hearing you, Mohammed. I don't know if maybe you can type the question. I will read it that to Diego great. so we can actually answer. We have another question from Luis Proaño as well. He's asking if you have any special bi 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 bibliography to find more collaborative strategies. Yeah, so I would be um, happy to send that your way. And I'm actually gonna send, uh, I'm actually gonna show how you can uh, connect with me. And again, I'll be happy to share the bibliography. So, you know, resources that you can use and even, you know, more about student-centered teaching, which in and of itself is a great uh, thing to learn more about. So I'll give you in a moment um, uh, a way to, to, to reach out to me and I'm more than happy to send this your way. Yeah. Remember also now that we're coming to the end of our session, our networking and our expo booths are open. The networking is actually a pretty cool option that we have. Just join it. You will have a minute. You might run into Diego and you can ask him a lot more questions, as many as you can fit in one minute. Or you might run into who you know, I don't know who, just teachers from all over the world. So it's great for networking, getting new connections. Maybe you can come up with some new ideas to blend your classes with somebody in Egypt, for example, if you're in Peru or Ecuador or anywhere. So just make sure you go there as well. Um, and the expo booths, you're gonna be able to see all the organizations that are working with us, uh, different schools, different products that they are bringing. So just also go through there. Yes. Sounds great. I want to thank you all so much uh, once again. Um, here's a final quote uh, just to wrap things up uh, that I really love. It's all kids, all kids care about something. It's my job to figure out what that something is and to run with it, right? This is Bill Nave, an educator. So every kid, you know, every student, to be honest, cares about something. And it's, you know, part of our job to find out what 
What is meaningful to our students? What do they care about? What do they cherish? What do they value the most? Okay, and to incorporate that into our classes, and that you know really goes a long way. And with that, I just want to thank everybody. Thank you so much, D, um, uh, for joining me on this session. And thank you everybody as well for joining us. And yeah, I hope you have enjoyed this session. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can look me up, uh, Diego Palacios Maciel, but I will also be in the networking booth. So we may run into each other. I'm more than happy to answer um, any questions or you know, continue the conversation there.